It's Gardening with Cisco. Dust off your trowels and connect your garden hoses. It's time for an hour of cultivated fun. Let's join Sassy Susan as she welcomes Cisco Morris. Cisco Kid was a friend of mine. Good morning, Cisco. How are you? Hey. Hey, Sassy, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, I am doing just great. It was kind of cold here this morning, but, you know, I have to say, between the pandemic and the politics, I sure have been looking forward to having you on the air today. Oh, well, thanks. I sure look forward to being on. It's always so much fun. And I have, I, you know, I hate to be a, I hate to be repeating again and again, but I am still having people come to me and say, you have such a good time with Cisco. I love to listen to you guys. How could you have so much fun? And it's like, I don't know. I guess I'm just lucky. <laughs> hey, I can never hear that too many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we even have someone that, uh, um, I mean, they give compliments all the time, but we had someone that, uh, one, she didn't have a question this week, but she did compliment you. So we will make sure that we get to that. But, uh, so right now, right now it is two minutes, it's two minutes past nine, and for those of you that are just joining, I am Sassy Susan, and we have the honor and privilege of having on KSQM with us, Cisco Morris. And we have, gar oh, I hear a puppy in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah, because uh, Mary's about to take them out on their walk, and they are so excited. Oh. And, uh, and it was uh, Izzy's birthday yesterday. Okay. So Izzy's my bigger look at dog, even though she weighs less than my other dog. And uh, there's pictures on Cisco.com. You go to their dog page. But, uh, oh, he, she had the day of her life. She got so many treats. She's going to be twice the dog she used to was after how that. Many, you know? How old is Izzy, did you say? She just turned three. Oh, okay. And, and Leo's one and a half. Oh. So they're uh, they're. <laughs> They're still in the digging stage. Let's put it down. I'm looking I, at the window. There's holes all over the place. I know. I I went out in the yard to do um, the as other pet under owners will understand poop patrol, and I see that oh, there yeah. are all these little holes all over Thor's yard, and it's like, <laughs> are you bored? What you have all these toys, but there's something about digging in the dirt. I, maybe they're part gardener like you. They are part of your family, so it must be in the blood, huh? <laughs> oh, my last dog, Fred, before these two, I had Fred, and I don't know what in the world he was. I'd buy him a $12 toy, hand it to him before I could even move. He's down the stairs, out the doggy door, and buries it somewhere in the back garden. By the time I get out there to job, he's already buried it. He's got a big brown nose, and I don't know where that $12 toy is. Oh, the things we do for our pets. Well, oh, you're not kidding. so do we have oh. a intro topic that we're going to discuss today since it is that time of year when people are putting their gardens to bed? Yeah, so I thought a really uh, important topic right now is to, uh, if you're if you're if you've got dahlias out there because you know it sounds like it's going to get pretty darn cold this week. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you've got dahlias out there, canna lilies that tend to come back and you don't dig them out, or you've got uh, you know there's a lot of other bulbs that I leave in the ground. Some of these. Uh, Fancy callus, for instance, you know, I I leave those in the ground. So the only way a lot of those are going to survive is if you cover them with fern frond. Uh, so what okay. I recommend is, you know, be ready because, you know, your dahlias are going to die right to the ground if it gets cold enough. And you could probably say goodbye to the flowers on your beautiful uh, hardy fuchsias. And <laughs> oh, it breaks my heart, the salvias, you know. But uh, so anything that, you know, has got bulbs underground or roots that you're worried about, you know, when you cut those, cut the top growth off, lilies, you could do this too. Just uh, put a bunch of fern fronds on top, like, you know, half, 
half a foot thick and put a stone on top. And if you do that, uh, two things will happen. You remember the bulbs under there, which is really helpful. You, you think I you're going to remember, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to remember that there's bulbs yeah. under there. And then a few months go by and you go, where did I plant those? <laughs> And you find out when you try and plant something new in spring and stick that shovel and you're like, no! (laughs) (laughs) So this will help a lot. And those fern fronds repel water, so they'll keep, they let a little through just what you want. But they're really good for repelling water. And uh, so it's, uh, there's one problem with it, of course, because you know what's on the back of ferns. A million spores. Yeah. I have so many ferns growing in this garden. Well, then you I never have a shortage of fronds, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that could be a little problem, but ferns are easy to take out if you don't like where yeah. they are, you know. And uh, But it'll really protect those kind of delicate plants, you know. And it, I mean, it doesn't always work. But uh, mostly, I never take any dahlias out anymore. I used to dig them out, mm-hmm. divide them, and store them. I don't do that to hardly anything. Some gladiolas occasionally, if it's not a hardy one. But I, I've gotten to the tendency, I'm becoming a lazy gardener, I No, guess. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> But uh, so I try and leave everything in the garden that I can, although I, you know, I mean, I do have 70 plants out in my garage right now. So I uh, guess I... Yeah. <laughs> no car. That's a great, great place to overwinter, right? Oh, it's a wonderful yeah, yeah. place to overwinter, and I've got a lot of lights out there and all windows on the south side, so it, it's pretty cool. I'd uh, maybe uh, next week for plant of the week, maybe I'll show a picture of what my garage looks like. That'd oh, be that would be fun. that would be interesting. <laughs> Give us a little touch of your home. That's right. <laughs> well, um, do you have a do you have a stumper question that that we can have people oh. start to? Call? I asked my husband this question this morning, and he said, "Ooh, I don't know what <laughs> I would say." <laughs> <laughs> This is a this is a very challenging stumper question. I'll tell you what, it's a fun one though. So okay, here okay. it is. You ready? Uh, the Cisco stumper for uh, November seventh. Is there anything good about fleas? Yeah. So is is there any quality or anything good? Do they have any fleas? redeeming value? That's what you're yeah, wondering. Yeah, that's, that's the best way to put it, right there. Okay, so for all you listeners out there, the stumper question of the day is, is there anything, oh, the phones are ringing right now, is there anything good about fleas? So if you want to give your input, you call 360-681-0000, and Linda will answer the phone, and then she will bring those responses into me, and then during this hour, I will give people an update. I, I can't, personally, I can't think of anything good about fleas. Because uh, something you'll you'll you that when I say it you'll go oh of course of course <laughs> of course <laughs> okay so we'll we'll find out what the and then at the bottom of the hour we're going to talk about the plant of the week so for all of you out there yeah. listening we have a, an hour of phenomenal information and entertainment waiting for you right Cisco <laughs> yeah yeah you betcha you betcha. Okay, so uh, do you have your thing? Now, this is a good opportunity for everyone out there to make sure you have your little cup of coffee or your cup of tea, and you got your piece of paper and your pen so you can make notes. There's going to be so much information that's shared that you can't keep it all in your brain. So the first question, this is from Brenda. And she says she has a weed in her flower beds. And she sent us a picture so you know what it looks like. And you'll you'll know what it oh, is. Yeah. That is rapidly spreading. It is extremely low growing and has minimal roots. I have to scrape the dirt to remove the weed, but it comes back and spreads. Roundup does nothing to kill this weed. Can you please tell me oh. what type of weed this is and what I can use to kill it? And Brenda, this was a this was a really good idea that Brenda had. She put a dime 
net on the plant so it gives a better idea of the perspective of the size. I, I really liked that. That was a that was a that was a good approach to take, Brenda. So what is this plant so you can tell Brenda? Okay, so uh, this is a very, very primitive plant. It's it's not actually a fungus. Uh, or, or a moss. It's an actual plant, but it's extremely primitive. And uh, I'm not even going to say the botanical name because it's so hard to pronounce. <laughs> but uh, the common name for this, and a lot of people are going to go, oh, I know that weed. It's called liverwort. And it looks kind of like a bunch of livers <laughs> it kinda... out in your garden. You know, it does. And, uh, it does. <laughs> and see, See, uh, in the Middle Ages, there was something called the Doctrine of Signatures. So these herbalist doctors in the Middle Ages, when we knew nothing about medicine at all, uh, they thought that if a plant looked like part of your body, God made them that way to tell human beings that this plant could be used to cure uh-huh. any disease that hit that part of the garden. So when you hear the word like there's lung wart, liver wart, tooth wart, these were all plants that look like parts of our bodies, and the doctor would make a, a medicine out of that and give it to us. In this, in, interestingly, they've gone back to see if any of these things did any good, Liverwort was so bad for you. It was <laughs> unbelievable. So, uh, and uh, most of these, did, none of them that I've ever seen did any good at all, but uh, you got treated with them. Yeah. So be glad you didn't live in the Middle Ages. But so, liverwort, though, is it comes on plants, and I'm not blaming the nurseries at all. They, there's not much you could do. These spores blow all over the place. And they love, like, greenhouses and things like that. So that's, and that's why when you buy a plant and there's, like, pebbles on the top of the soil when you buy a plant or some other thing, they're trying to keep that liverwort from getting a hold in the plant. Ah. But if you, yep. And so if, you, you if they seed, have gravel on top of the dirt, the spores can't germinate. Yeah, that's oh, the idea okay. anyway. I'm not okay. sure. Not sure it always works, but they try. <laughs> they try. So so I've had it many a time in this garden, and uh, right now I couldn't find any. I was looking around because, you know, I probably could use that for a TV show or something. <laughs> but but uh, so uh, it loves moist, shady places. And if, if uh, ground never dries out, oh, does it love that. That's its favorite place. So you said it loves shady places? Is that what you said? I was having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Moist, shady. Uh, Okay. Moist and shady. Okay. Yeah. If a spot doesn't dry out, you're probably going to get this sooner or later. And, uh, you know, there are some sprays. People spray vinegar on it, for instance. The problem is, if there's any other plants growing around it, you'll kill the plant yeah. that it's growing around, you know. So uh, you might just, I think she's doing it the right way, the way she's trying to get rid of it. There are these special holes. They're called uh, scuffle hole or stirrup hole. The stirrup hole looks like a stirrup on a horse. Mm-hmm. It's hollow in the a middle. A stirrup on a saddle. Yeah. Let, let, st- horses don't have stirrups. The saddle oh. has stirrups, okay? Oh, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> I used to have a horse, so I know horses don't Ooh. come with stirrups, yeah. <laughs> I'll, bet it's, I'll bet it's so fun to have a horse. But anyway, so, so and they also have scuffle holes. They're just kind of flat little diamond-shaped hoses. Uh-huh. That are, you know, so anyway, either of them are made just to scrape something off the surface of the soil without digging in hardly at I've all. I've seen those. I've seen those. Yep. I've seen the stirrup hose. Yeah, so they're, they're really great because uh, liverwort doesn't even have roots. All it's got are these teensy little hairs on the bottom oh, that try and okay. get a little moisture. And they, so, uh, 
sort of thing is if if you scrape it off a lot, you'll probably never get rid of it, but it won't become a super menace. And just rake it up, but get it out. Don't throw it in your compost pile, whatever you do. <laughs> you know, You're get it out it. of there. If you got to... <laughs> <laughs> if you gotta throw it in the garbage, but get it out of there, cause uh, it'll be back, and you'll spread it all over your garden if you put it in compost and then spread the compost. So, yeah. So the the big composting facilities, they uh, they get so hot they kill the spores. Yeah. So okay, you know, it's so okay it's okay to give it to them. Liverwort. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and don't take it if your liver sore. It's not going to do any good, let me tell you. Okay. Uh, well, that that was informative. We learned about a little bit of history as well as gardening. You are just a fount of knowledge, I must say. It is 16 <laughs> minutes past 9. You're tuned to K-Squim 91.5, and you are tuned to Gardening with Cisco. I'm Sassy Susan. Now, here is a compliment that I wanted to. Now, I don't want your head to get too big, Cisco, Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is from Gloria, and she asked the question last week about the murder wasps. And Cisco, I don't have a question for you this week. I just wanted to thank you for being so kind and thoughtful in your explanation of murder wasps. I was terrified, but your calm explanation made me feel so much more relieved. Thank you from Gloria. Isn't that nice? That is so nice. I could tell. Thank you. Thank yeah. You, thank you. I could tell from her a message uh, when she called in that she was. I mean, they, these murder wasps are like two inches long or so, and they can oh, devastate they a, a honeybee hive in in a matter of hours. So I I knew that she was upset. But right now, before we continue, being an Air Force veteran that we're celebrating, Cisco, we're celebrating Veterans Week. And I feel very privileged because guess what? Guess what branch of the service we're honoring today? Dun, 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 <laughs> uh, that's right, the Air Force. That is my branch of service. I am a retired nurse from the Air Force. And KSQM honors veterans with special programming recognizing a specific branch of our military each day for this entire week, culminating on November 11th. We honor America's veterans for their patriotism, love of country, and willingness to serve and sacrifice for all Americans. Today, we dedicate our broadcast to the honor of the United States Air Force and Space Force and all who have so nobly served. Now, we've every hour we're doing a little fun fact, and here perhaps one of the coolest jobs Air Force members have are tasked one of the coolest jobs Air Force members are tasked with is to watch and track Santa as he treks the globe on oh. Christmas Eve. The NORAD Santa Tracker goes live every December to track Santa's trip around the world, courtesy of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, also known as Air Force. NORAD has maintained this tradition since 1955. Today, you can download wow. apps to follow this on your smartphone. You can also follow along on the website, noradsanta.org, which fires up on December 1st. So in honor of the Air Force, we are going to hear a quick song from Glenn Miller and the Army Air Force Band, appropriately titled, I'll Be Home for Christmas. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Gardening with Cisco. Case Gwim, 91.5. <laughs> That that was a uh, that was Glenn Miller and the Army Air Force Band with "I'll Be Home for Christmas." It's 21 minutes past nine. We are honoring the United States Air Force today. So every hour, I'm going to be giving you a little tidbit. But right now, we're going to get back to gardening with Cisco. And here, our next question, Cisco, is: All righty. Is it possible to root a liquid bar? Blah, blah, blah. How do you pronounce that? Uh, liquid ambar. Liquid ambar. Those are sweet gum trees. Yeah, yeah. All these technical names I have a hard time with. Seedless sweet gum. <laughs> they want to know if they can root one. This is from Johnny and Page. And if you can you know, do it, I, they want to know how. 
okay. I'm going to give them the easiest way. There's different ways you could uh, root different plants. Sweet gum trees, just for people that are wondering what a sweet gum tree is, they're those trees, they look, the leaves look a lot like a maple leaf, and they turn unbelievably fantastic colors, every color in the rainbow in the fall, and they get those big seed pods. They're, uh, they look like some kind of uh, outer space thing or something. They're, they're about the size of a ping pong ball with all these little sharp things coming off them. People hate the seeds. Oh, that's so a I sweet gum. Okay, I've seen those. Yeah, yep. So that's why Johnny and Paige, I guess, I really hope it, uh, you know, get uh, one that doesn't have those nuts, those seeds. So uh, the way you could do it, you wait until the leaves, so they got to know somebody, of course, that's got one. Then uh, as soon as the leaves fall off, they can go out there and take cuttings, probably about eight, I'd say 12-inch long cuttings off the end of a few branches. And then what they could do is they can either make a big, box out of wood or something that's about a foot tall, or they could just find some good nursery pots that are about a foot tall and uh, that have drain holes in them. And uh, what you do is you're either going to fill your big box, which will have nothing on the bottom so that the water can drain right through into the ground, or you can uh, fill your nursery pots, the black nursery pots you bring home, with uh, either seeding or um, or cutting uh, uh, material, so it's special soil that you could buy at nurseries to to start seeds or to root cuttings. And they're also going to have to buy some root tone, which is a hormone that you dip the plant into that uh, tends to make roots grow. And so they'll cut this. 12-inch thing long, take all the leaves off except for on the very top, and they're going to stick it so they filled that box or they filled their uh, little nursery pots with uh, this uh, rooting uh, material, and they stick, they stick the uh, branch they want to root in there, and there's no leaves down in that material, only on the top. So the top four inches of the cutting sticks out the top. And then what you could do, if you, if you, have, if you made a box, put that, make sure that box is in a shady spot out of the wind outside. Otherwise, you could take these containers. And the priest used to do this at Seattle University. It's a Jesuit college where I worked for 24 years. And the priest used to do this, and we did it too on, our, on my grounds crew. And, and we would bury these in the ground so just the top was sticking out in a, in a shady spot, bright shade. And then you just leave those over the winter. You don't touch them. You don't do anything to them. Mom and nature waters them, so make sure they're somewhere where the rain can get to them. And then... They're going to start rooting in those containers, whatever kind of container you got them in. You leave them in there all next summer, making sure that the material never dries out, that you're trying to get the roots to grow in in there. And uh, then in the fall, uh, you can either you could dig them up in the fall, but we'd usually leave them in there one more winter, and we'd dig them up in uh, very, very early spring, and plant them out, and well, I almost always. Now it doesn't work with every plant, but I know that sweet gum it works well. Uh, you'll find that that container or wherever you're rooting them are be loaded with roots, and you just plant them uh, so that the roots just start right below the soil surface. You got yourself a brand new, totally for free sweet gum tree, and I did this with. So many different kinds of plants, hydrangeas. You know, some some just won't do it, but most kind do pretty easily. Hmm. So uh, it's an easy way, not much hassle, doesn't take much space. Way to uh, get a lot of uh, 
cuttings the root of a lot of cool plants so it's a good way to propagate yeah huh okay well hopefully that'll help her help johnny and Paige um start their own little seedless sweet gum tree hmm. yeah and if it doesn't work call next year in the spring <laughs> I'll give you a different idea then, because there are other ways to do it too. But yeah. Usually works. Oh, okay. All right. So um, last week or so, I don't know, the weeks, I don't know, for me, the weeks kind of flow together. Do they flow together oh, for you too? I mean, it's oh, yeah. like, well, I always go, did I already tell this story last yeah. week? I mean, this is, this is week number three, 13 of this show. I wow. can't believe it. I mean, the time just goes by so fast. So this, was, this is a follow-up on a question that we answered a week or two ago about mulch. Um, is it better to mow the leaves or to use them whole? And are there leaves you should avoid using as mulch? That's a really good question because there's all yeah. the leaves that are falling right now and people want to do something with them, but do I go over them with a the mower? Do I put them on hole? Is this tree going to poison? Uh, what, so what advice do you have for Carl? That is an excellent question, Carl. So uh, in fact, I just uh, did this. I just shot uh, this for Evening Magazine yesterday in my garden i did that and i did a thing on uh, i don't know when these are going to show yet yeah you're usually on tuesdays one. yeah usually tuesdays. usually tuesday yeah, she'll she'll send me an email probably monday telling me when they'll be on okay. so i'll know next week yeah and uh i don't think they'll be on this next tuesday i don't think she'll have time to put it oh, together okay. yet but uh, i also did one on a growing african violet so uh but anyway uh I remember this question about leaves, and um, so yes, you know, if leaves are teeny like Japanese maple leaves, then I just let them fall in the garden. I don't worry about them. So if they're not too big, I'd say, you know, if if a leaf isn't more than a half inch wide or something, feel free just to let it fall in your garden, and you're fine. If they're any bigger than that, they could pack down. Yeah. And if they pack down and they don't break down very well, then uh, it can actually cause trouble. So uh, if that's the case, I throw them on the lawn. I rake them out of the bed, which is a pain in the kazutsuki, <laughs> to say the least. Throw them on the lawn. Mow them. I mow them. Now, if you have a, a bag, a bag on your mower, that's perfect. You could just bag when you mow and throw all that in, and it's the best mulch you ever had in your life. But if you don't, like me, I've got a mulching mower, and I don't know what happens at a bagger. So uh, what I do is I just mow them, and then I rake them up and use them as mulch. And uh, that works good because, like, my neighbor has a big leaf magnolia, these leaves are a foot long and six inches wide. You know, you could, three of them would cover a whole bed, you know. And yeah. Oh, so I, I mow those up and everything, but the, the bad thing is you wouldn't believe how little mulch you get. <laughs> you, you mow and mow, and you're thinking, man, there's a mountain of leaves out here, and then you get like a little half of a bucket full of mulch, you know. But uh, it's really quality mulch so i mow them but i do want to warn you one big big thing and and oh by the way and if you mow leaves most of the time you know because you don't want to leave them sitting on the lawn it could kill the grass uh -huh. but if you mow them usually that's all you got to do unless you know you got a big leaf maple and eight billion leaves around there it's going to be too much use them as mulch after you mow but uh there are some leaves you should never use and one, I think we had a call last week from a woman who had a black walnut. Oh, yeah. She, she didn't she know what to do with walnuts. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were falling like bombs from 100 <laughs> feet up. And uh, so black walnut, uh, it's aliopathic it, it, uh, in the leaves and uh, the nuts and the roots and everything. It, it emits things that uh, won't let anything else grow. So the last thing you want to do is use a black walnut, hickory, pecan, all these big nut trees, any kind of walnut tree. You don't want to ever use those leaves as mulch. They're huh. not good. Yeah, well, that's, they, they, a, that's interesting. Yeah, because I've never heard that before. Yeah. 
Yeah, they give off something called Juglone. And, Ooh, uh, it that just sounds nasty. Let, yeah, you know, <laughs> it does. <laughs> it? It, you know, you some I've had people write me and say they can't even grow a fruit tree within 60 feet of their black walnut. Huh. Well, that's yeah, because I know what I mentioned that when I, where I grew up in Western New York, we had a huge the family still owns the house and a huge black walnut tree. But my, we had apple trees and pear trees not too far away. So I guess we were special and we didn't know it. Hmm. I'm glad. I'm glad. I <laughs> yeah. out. So but so black walnuts, one you don't want to use. You never want to use a leaf that uh, is diseased. So let's say you have apple scab where mm -hmm. you get these little black spots on the leaves and then you get these warts on the uh, apple. It's not the worst uh, disease there is. There's worse ones, but it's still not one you want. Yeah. And if you use those leaves, even if you mow them, the spores survive and it, and the uh, Chunks of leaf will sporulate. Yeah. So if you put those back under your apple tree, you're just saying, okay, you've had it, buddy. You're going to have the worst case of uh, apple measles there's ever been. So, so uh, Okay, you know. so don't use black walnut leaves or hickory or pecan or any diseased leaves from any... Yeah, yeah. I think that's about it. Okay, oh, okay. You know, even... Yeah, and, and make sure you mow if it's uh, oak leaves. They don't break down well. You yeah. really want to mow those uh, oak leaves and rhododendron leaves. you got to mow those. They're yeah. like little rocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, FCC rules. We need to do a station ID, and then you can do the plant of the week. How's that? Oh, great. All right, okay. so here's a station ID. You're tuned to 91.5 KSQM Squim. And it is 26 minutes to 10 right now. For those of you just joining, we just told you, you're listening to KSQM 91.5. I'm Sassy Susan, and we have Gardening with Cisco, Cisco Morris, gardener extraordinaire. This is the only place that you can hear Cisco on the radio. So what plant of the week do you have for us, Cisco? I've got a real beauty, and uh, all of them are beauties. Well, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> well, the one I've got today is Salvia elegans, golden delicious. So these are called pineapple sages, and you see them in the nursery, usually in spring. This one has golden foliage and beautiful bright red flowers. They make great tea if you like herbal teas, mm -hmm. and if you just rub against them, it smells like a pineapple. Oh, uh, that sounds that wonderful. I'm, oh, they are, and I'm looking at one right out the window right now, and I'd say it's almost four feet tall, and it has red flowers, and the hummingbirds can't leave them alone. Now, here's the weird thing about pineapple sage. I have a million sages or salvias in my garden and they're all attractive to hummingbirds but uh, pineapple sage is sold as an annual so they they tell you it's going to die at the end of the year the other thing is it won't even bloom probably till uh, late august or september but uh if you get like this uh golden one which is golden delicious it looks fantastic. It's so bright gold, the foliage, and it feeds the hummingbirds right now. This is a key time for hummingbirds because a lot of the things that feed hummingbirds are dying back like crazy right now. But those really do their little thing until, you know, we get a hard freeze. If we get a hard freeze this week, it might be the end of that pineapple sage. And the, the funny thing is they tell you you're buying it as an annual the one I'm looking at out the window, Mary planted the spring before this, so a year ago, and it bloomed real nice in fall, and we, it was right by our patio, so we saw hummingbirds on it all the time in September and early October, because we eat out there every night. And, uh, but uh, I'm looking at that one blooming away, so it survived, because last winter was not very cold, it was mild. And it looks so fantastic in the fall garden. Golden foliage, beautiful red flowers. So it's worth it. 
And they cost almost nothing when you buy one. So put them somewhere where you're going to want a spectacular display in the fall. And then, you know, this will bloom until I'm already starting to see some of my other hummingbird feeding plants are starting to set blooms. So it won't be long, and my hummingbirds will be happy all winter long mm. with uh, the plants that bloom during winter. So yeah, it so, plays a key role. So this is salvia. It, t- give me the name again. Salvia elegans. Elegans. Okay. All right, and they can see a picture of it on your on the website yeah. Cisco. C I S C O E. Really beautiful picture. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that's right. C I S C O E. Hey, why we're mentioning my website? I just want to mention one quick thing, and that is that. Uh, so now on the right side of the front page, you'll see my Facebook Live things I do every Thursday for the Bellevue Botanical Garden. So this week I did about something called the podophyllum, which I'll show. I'll show that. Uh, I'll make that a plant of the week next year because uh, <laughs> they're already fading back. It would be crazy, but I talked about it. And so it's a lot of fun to watch. And uh, also, want to let people know there's a really good webinar coming up that's only 10 bucks unless you belong to the Northwest Horticultural Society, which I'm on the board for. But um, so if you go to Cisco.com, you can find it. It's called Argentine Plant Hunting on the Cusp of COVID. So it's two of my best friends go all over the world and, and find seeds from rare plants. And then they grow them at Far Reach's farm, and, uh, which is a nursery. And anyway, but it's a, it, they're really funny and great speakers. So you might want to check this one out. Only 10 bucks. Hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah, there's a link right on the front page of Cisco.com. Okay, C-I-S-C-O-E dot com, Cisco. Yeah, you betcha. (laughs) Okay, right now it's 21 minutes to 10. You're two to K-Squim. We have Gardening with Cisco. This is a question that... Um, I guess somehow we missed it. It was uh, called in a couple, sent in a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to do it. This is from oh. Janet. Uh, hello, Cisco. I was recently gifted, given a gift of a Hanoki cypress tree. It is about four feet tall, and I was thinking of planting it to stand out as a focal point nearby some rose bushes. It would get partial sun. Do you think this cypress would do well here? Thanks so much. Well, she is so lucky because the tree she was gifted can take semi-shade. Oh. Most conifers, yeah, it's really lucky because most conifers have to have full sun. Very few of them can take shade. You know, yew trees, uh, Y-E-U, they can take shade. Uh, there's a few other rare ones, you know, but... Uh, but Hinoki cypress, which are these wonderful, most of them are dwarf. I bet the one she got is. And uh, some have golden foliage, some uh, just green. The only problem is if it's in too much shade, it won't get much golden foliage. But, uh, but they can handle shade really well. Not deep shade, but the kind of shade she just described yeah. is perfect. So, yeah, plant that right away. It's going to be, they're one of the prettiest conifers you can get. They're just gorgeous. One thing I will warn uh, her about, and that is that, uh, you know, they say they get like three feet tall if you bite a dwarf. Well, I've got some 12-footers out there Ooh. in my garden that are dwarfs. They don't <laughs> stop growing. Conifers never do. So, uh, but they're quite prunable. So yeah. If she needs to, you can prune it, keep it the height you want. It'll get wider. You yeah. can't do much about that, but uh, it'll be great. So she can get that in the ground now. Now would be a good time to she get could, that in the ground. Yeah. I don't know how bad the freeze is supposed to be. She might wait till we get through this little freezing okay. period right now. Okay. All and right. And plant it right after that. Okay. All right. Well, let's, we've got a, a, question that was just sent in um, from Kathleen. Uh, Good morning, Cisco. I've been trying to be a better gardener. I guess you've motivated her. I don't know. So I decided to put two of my 24-inch tall raised beds to bed this year. 
I was shocked how compacted the soil was when I started to till them a bit. Turns out they were both full of roots. Not really thick ones, but there were many, many roots. Seems it seems like more than would be that would let's start over again. It seems like more than would be just from the tomatoes and squash that were growing there. Now there used to be grass in that area and also a tree, though that was not there when we placed them. Do you think the roots are coming from the bottom? We only have some chicken wire at the bottom to keep critters from coming through. Thank you for your help. This is from Kathleen. So how, yeah. why are her, up, uh, why are her um, raised beds, why are they so c compacted and full of roots? This is one of the worst problems that happens to people. And what it is somewhere nearby, I'm willing to bet anything, she's got a tree that's still growing. <laughs> and some trees can send roots, especially if it's like an elm tree, a giant sequoia, a lot of conifers do it. So even if it's 50 feet away, it may be roots from a tree. Wow. And, and yeah, and, you know, the thing is people go, oh, it's a raised bed. I don't have a problem. <laughs> well, yes, you do, because the roots come right up, and we fertilize. We do all these great things, and the roots are just like, oh, man, this is wonderful. This is a smorgasbord. So, Look what they're doing for me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, now, here's the problem, and it's... It, it, you know, she could get some what they call weed cloth and put that down. She'd have to take all the soil out, and uh, then she's probably going to have to anyway if it's just full of roots. And then she could put that on the bottom, and that'll totally stop the roots from coming back up. The problem is that stuff clogs up a lot. Yeah. And if it, if it clogs up, then you don't get the drainage, and drainage is really critical so uh, what she might be able to do is is you know dig out that soil and start over that's what I do I'm sorry to have to say that because that's a lot of work you know but then what she could do is dig around it and dig a trench three feet deep around it I hate to tell her to do all this work and put in weed cloth you know put Put something in the ground that'll hold the weed, weed cloth and stick it uh, vertically around the whole thing. And if you go down to where there's good hard pan, so it may only take a foot deep in the ground, might take six inches. If you hit hard pan, roots won't go through hard pan. Tree roots just stay on the surface. It's interesting. About 85% to 90% of a tree's roots are in the top six inches of the soil. Really? So, yeah. They just they hate hard pan. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah. Yep. So if you just dig down the hard pan, figure out a way to, to put uh, a vertical protection of weed cloth down there. It doesn't matter if that gets clogged up, but it'll stop those roots from coming through. And you'll never have this problem again, or not for years and years. You might have to replace the weed cloth now and then, but but it's supposed to last a long time. That's the only way I ever hmm. use weed cloth, okay. or something like that. One, hasn't it been wonderful out? The it, warm weather and the wind, oh, I know. exquisite. Yes, yes. And I took a picture yesterday of the mountains that you can see from our house with the snow. The, the, the mountains have a little uh, capping of snow now. So, um, and then with it getting dark early, I think winter is going to come. Even, we can't stop it, Cisco. It's going to come where, no, whenever, whether we're ready or not. That dog winter. <laughs> okay, so uh, in response to the flea question, okay, now for those people that did not hear, this, the Cisco Stumper question this morning was, is there anything good about fleas? And if you have any input, you can call 360-681-0000. And here Jeremy called in. He stated there is absolutely nothing to be said on the positive side for fleas, whether they are sand fleas or otherwise. Then Anne from Port Townsend, she called in, and she said, fleas are a scourge and nothing more. And then Brandy 
from Squim said she and her two puppies, Barney and Fred, agree that fleas are terrible. And she has a question. What is the best way to deal with fleas in the garden in a way that won't harm my pups or other animals? So is that gonna is that something that you're gonna tell us when you give us the answer, or do you do you want to answer that thing about? T- I I should answer that right now. Okay. I think. Okay. It, and that is that fleas in the garden. You're not gonna be able to do much about that. You don't want to be spraying a bunch of pesticides out in the garden for anything. And you know the old idea that if you use cedar uh, as a uh, if you use ground up cedar, you know, cedar bark as a mulch that gets rid of fleas. I've seen no proof of that. It's kind of funny because I have a friend who gave his dog garlic, so much garlic to try and keep fleas off his dog. And I'd see him, I could smell him two blocks away <laughs> coming down the street. And there were all these fleas just leaping on that dog. <laughs> they, it must have been Italian fleas. That's all I know. <laughs> they loved so garlic. So that doesn't work either. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think I think the key, though, is what you do indoors. You know, and I, I, my dogs take pills to try and keep fleas away, and that's kind of controversial. But, yeah. Uh, but one of mine's really uh, allergic to flea bites, and we have to go that way. Yeah. But um, but the key thing is, like, we vacuum every day. We don't let the dogs on the couches or in the bed. And, uh, you know, we try to do a really good job of vacuuming. And, you know, I, we don't do as good about washing their beds as we should. But anything you could do like that really makes a huge difference. Yeah. And you got to figure, you know, there's not that many fleas out in the garden. they got to be eating something, you know, so they're not going to hang around where there's nothing to eat. And any time your dog plays with another dog in the park, well, you're going to be vacuuming extra. Cause yeah. <laughs> if that guy's got fleas, your guy's going to have fleas, you know. Okay, so we'll find out at the end of the show what the redeeming factor of fleas are. I I can't. There add is a, one. There is one. Okay, but don't tell us yet. Don't. But if anyone I has, won't. if anyone has any input, three six zero six eight one zero 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 zero. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, we just planted a five gallon size gunnera. Is that? Did I say that right here? Uh, in, yeah, Gunnera. That's yeah, and this is from plant. Pam. A five-gallon size Gunnera here in North Lake Stevens, Zone 8B, just this summer. We watered it daily, and it set up healthy new growth. But, of course, it's a perennial, so it, it's wilted down with the first cold temperatures. I hear we should cover it with straw for the winter cold temperatures as we've gotten down to 5 degrees rarely. Should I trim the stems at all? I'm thinking no. Thanks, Pam. Okay, well, uh, just for people who don't know what a gunnera is, gunneras come, there's two kinds, one's from uh, South America and uh, mainly Chile, and I've seen 20-foot tall ones hiking in Chile, and uh, they also come from New Zealand, and these are plants, one leaf gets the size of five people. Oh, my They're gosh. They're just huge things. Yeah, and you don't see 20 tall ones very often but they they can get up to 12 15 feet tall i mean this is the kind of plant you got to have room for it <laughs> to say the least i had one i loved it but i had to pull it out it just was taken over the whole garden they're they're a, they like full sun and constantly moist soil they hate dryness they they grow along the sides of uh streams and things like in chile so, uh, but they don't want to sit in water, just moist soil. So the problem is they aren't that hardy, and especially when they're young. So if they just planted that uh, gunnera in Lake Stevens, which I don't think Lake Stevens is Zone 8B. I'd say it's more like Zone 7 in my opinion, which yeah. means it gets colder. But anyway, uh Here's what I always did with mine, and it never failed. And I'm up at 500 feet in Seattle, so it gets pretty cold here. 
so you you cut the leaf. They've got huge stems that come out, and they've got this gigantic fruit thing on the bottom that looks like a big pyramid at the bottom. It's really cool looking. And you cut the the leaves the, at the bottom of the stem, right where it comes out of the base of the plant. Take those huge leaves, turn them upside down, and put it over the heart of the plant. So you just you take all those big, huge leaves and use them as a cover. Uh, and I leave the big stalk even sticking up in the air and just cover those uh for the winter and then in early spring you know once things start to warm up just a bit you take those back off and uh that that even in really cold weather that always saved mine uh, straw is kind of risky to use these days because sometimes straw they sometimes in certain areas they spray straw with a uh, herbicide that doesn't kill the straw, but it kills weeds that grow in the straw that they don't want the cattle to eat. And the problem is if you get straw that's been sprayed with that herbicide, it could kill all your plants in your garden. I'm terrified of using straw anymore. There was, there was quite a big problem with this a long time ago, and then I thought they had the whole problem solved. And I got an email a couple of years ago, and it happened to a woman again. So I'd go that route that I described. Just take those giant leaves, turn them over. I'm, you know, it's a little risky, but I'm 90% sure that you'll see your gunnera come back next spring. Okay. Huh. Um, this question was just phoned in. Um, Eileen from, and this has, it's about a Hanoki cypress. Um, Eileen from Port Angeles has a small Hinoki cypress that has been in the ground mostly in mostly in sun for two to three years. In the last few weeks, dry brown needles have appeared inside. She's worried it might be dying, and is there something you could recommend? Is this normal? I think this is. We have a Hinoki cypress, and it's in on facing the south side. And I noticed yesterday that the interior needles are starting to turn brown, and it's been there for many years. What Help Eileen and me. I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, that's the that's the problem with Hinoki cypress. They tend to all, all conifers do this. So we call them evergreen, but they're not evergreen because you know old needles, or they call them scales on these uh, yeah. Hinoki cypress. These old leaves they become unproductive and and over time die, and it's always the innermost ones usually that it happens to. And then uh, they just sit in the tree and look horrible, and they keep growing new ones that take their place out on the outside. So really the best thing to do is just get in there. You could do it with a hose. You could do it with your hand. Just beat the tweedle out of the plant <laughs> try and get some of that brown stuff out of there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there is one thing though. On, on, there's some Hinoki cypress, like there's one I really love, and it's called Ludia, and uh, it's famous for uh, getting a lot of brown needles. It burns in the sun, oh. and it's got this great golden color. So all you could do is try and knock off the needles that get burned. So when if I plant a ludia, I, and I have one in my garden, I put that one in semi-shade. It gets enough morning sun to turn gold, but it doesn't get that hot afternoon sun and wind because that's what burns them. Yeah. But, it, but, but don't worry. As long as you're Hinoki cypress, if it's the inside needles, nothing to worry about. Okay, good. If, if the outside ones, that's not so good. Okay, so um, Eileen and I can take comfort in uh, in taking care of our Hinoki cypress. Maybe when the sun is shining this weekend, I'll go out and and Thor and I can go knock those brown needles off. Yep. Cool. Hey, there's one one last thing I would, should say. Don't overwater Hinoki cypress. They don't like too much water. Okay. They're 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 very drought tolerant. You rarely need the water unless it's the hottest time and then 
you want you know well drained soil for yeah for that okay ball. Okay, well, we had another flea remark called in. Uh, Beverly from Port Angeles, she said, the good thing about fleas is they give the dog more exercise because the dog is scratching all the time. So that's... Well, I'll tell if if she got it at the end. (laughs) Okay, well, right now it's... She is one one intelligent woman. You're tuned to KSQM. 91.5 91.5 Squim. That's right. And you are listening to Gardening with Cisco, and I'm Sassy Susan, and we are just having a good time today. And uh, so we're getting people call in about the positives of fleas. But let's see, we have a couple of more <laughs> gardening questions. When is the best time to prune my cherry trees? They have not been cut back for a couple of years, and I'd like to severely prune them this year. They are pretty old cherry trees. He doesn't say how old is. And stand about, who, 35 to 40 feet tall. Oh, my gosh. After pruning, do I feed them? This is from Jason. Those are big cherry trees. They are. And, Jason, they sound like they're old cherry trees, but they're not going to get much older if you (laughs) overdo that pruning. Yeah, there's a rule on how much you should cut off, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, never more than one third of the wood yeah. in any one pruning, and that's only in winter time. In summer, no more than a tenth. So, uh, so I'd say, why bother lowering the height if they're thirty-five feet tall now? You're even if you lower it, you know, if you lower it a third, you're going to do a lot of damage to that tree. And what's going to happen is it's going to get decay like mad. It's going to send up a million sprouts that are going to shade out the leaves below, and they're going to start to die. And uh, any more than a third, you could put the tree into shock. And I've seen it kill cherry trees. So my opinion is uh, if, if you really want to prune it, thinning it would be okay. No more than a third of the wood. Thin it out so lots of light gets in. The tree will look really attractive. If you, and if you don't lower it down and you just thin it, you won't get near the regrowth. It'll stay much more attractive. So I'd either hire a, a good arborist that knows what they're doing, or I would just go to plantamnesty.com, mm-hmm. and that, there's links in cisco.com. Go to tips and find links, and go to plantamnesty.com. And ask them, you've got plenty of time because you're going to do the pruning when the leaves are off. Have them send you some of their little very inexpensive pamphlets on how to prune fruiting cherry trees or flowering, whatever you got. And uh, it'll, save you, it'll save you a lot of hard work for the rest of your life because if it starts sprouting, it never stops. And it'll probably save the life of your cherry, too. Okay. All right, so here's we've talked about red um, red twig dogwood. We have some of those in our yard. They look so pretty. And this uh, Pam wants to know how far back can I cut a red twig dogwood? I used to cut it back hard, but I neglected to do that for the past few years. It's about 18 feet tall now. Will it kill it if I cut it back close to the ground next spring? Well, you know, this is interesting because my wife, Mary, asked me the same question about five years ago. So we, you know, we, I think most people know, Mary and I are both expert gardeners, so we have to divide the garden into his and her gardens and don't even step foot in the other person's garden. You know? A little Any competition, huh? I give, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Any advice I give to Mary is the opposite of what I want her to do because then it might happen. But anyway, <laughs> so, but she's, you know, she, we're walking the dogs by her garden, and she goes, uh, you know, I don't know why I let these uh, red twig dogwoods grow so tall, because if you cut them down, only the new growth gets the red twigs. Right. So if you, every year, you cut them to four inches from the ground, they come up with all this beautiful red twigs and uh, that you get to enjoy all winter, and they don't get so tall, you know. You don't get the berries as much, though, and the birds love the berries. So anyway, she, hers was probably close to that tall. I don't know if they're 18 feet. And uh, 
she said, do you think that's going to kill us if I try cutting it back? And I said, well, are, are they shading out half your stuff in your garden? She goes, yeah, they are. I said, why don't you try it? What do you got to lose? And we'll both find out. <laughs> she did. She cut them to about six inches from the ground. I mean, it, they had trunks that were, you know, a foot thick. And it didn't hurt it a bit. They all came back. They're still blooming out there. I mean, uh, you know, right now they've got great fall color. But they're out there every year, and that was five years ago. Okay, so, so if she yes, just... No, go on. So, Pam, wait till next spring. But when new growth starts next spring, uh, chop away with impunity. And uh, <laughs> if, if this does... Uh, kill your plants. Tell everybody that somebody else gave you this advice. Yeah, don't tell them that Cisco. So in the sp- in the spring, cut them six inches from the ground. The whole thing. Yep. The whole and, kitten caboodle. Yep, and yeah, red twig dogwoods are amazingly tough. I yeah. am, I am ninety nine percent sure that you'll have no problem. They'll okay. Come back. All right. So Pam, get those clippers out in the spring. Okay, uh, Kimmy wants to know, will my Cleopatra canna lily survive if I leave it in the ground over winter? Hmm. Ah, uh, Kimmy, sorry, but no. Kimmy. Cleopatra, <laughs> for people who don't, this is the most spectacular canna lily there is. They are tricolor, so they're green, but they have these dark red streaks go through them with some other colors on the side. They are, and this is the, the leaves, and they get about four feet tall. And then the flowers are uh, multicolored. They're usually like, I can't remember, red and white, I think, but they're maybe yellow. They're spectacular. And uh, I used to have some, but mine all died, and i got to get some new ones again and get started again. But if you leave it in the ground, even if you cover it with fern fronds, I can almost guarantee you'll never see it again. These Cleopatra canna lilies are not hardy at all. So uh, even friends of mine that have them that live in really mild areas that are much warmer than where I live, they have to dig theirs out. You could let them go dormant, but I wouldn't if I were you. If you've got a window in an unheated garage or somewhere where you can keep them cool, but allow them to uh, keep growing over the winter without cutting them back and just pot them up in good potting soil, keep them by a window, water them whenever you see them start to wilt. If you can keep them actively growing through the winter and then put them out against the south wall or something on every nice day in spring, and once they start growing good, you can dig them out and replant them in the garden, then... They'll bloom way earlier. They'll uh, be the most spectacular thing in your garden. It's worth digging those. Okay, so dig them up. I would have done that to mine. Dig them up and put them in the garage. That's yeah. Yeah, we got to do that because it it is it does get cold around here. Okay, now right now it's seven minutes past ten. You're tuned to K Squim ninety one point five. I'm Sassy Susan, and we have the honor and the privilege of having Cisco Morris on the air with us, answering all your gardening questions. Let's do one more question, and then we'll talk about uh, the fleas. We'll get the answers right. for the fleas. <laughs> because I know you said you still have plants to get into your garage, and there, so I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, yeah, I'm going to be busy. Yeah, that's right. So this question is from Elliot, and Elliot wants to know, when is the best time to divide hostas? Can I do it now? or is it better to wait until spring? And the p- second part to this question, well, it's really three parts. When, what's the best time, can I do it now? Or, and is it true you can eat hosta? I've never heard well, of that, hardly, but, you know? Hardly anybody knows that. Yeah, you can eat hostas. They, they're a delicacy in Japan. Oh, really? What yeah. part do you eat? Yeah, you eat the leaves right when they come up in the spring. Huh. Leaves so in the I think spring. when they're about four to six inches tall is the only time they're really any good. Huh. And I, I think they eat them in stir fries and things. I never have eaten one, but uh, 
Well, uh, Elliot must be an international <laughs> traveler or something to inquire about I this. Think he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what what's the best time to divide these hostas? Sounds like he's a hosta expert. He is, I think. <laughs> but don't do it now, Elliot. Okay. It's uh, this, because it would just be sitting there in the cold ground doing nothing. So uh, instead, wait till next spring. As soon as the hosta leaves are four inches tall, just take your digging spade. Cut out a chunk of them right out of the clump. Fill that back in with good soil. Take that clump you cut out and put it in, uh, plant it wherever you want hostas to grow in a nice shady spot. And you have just uh, divided your hosta. There's no easier plant to divide if you do it when the leaves are about four inches tall. Yeah. We and have some cool. hostas. I, I was unfamiliar with them, but they are so pretty that you know you plant them and they they grow and then but then you got to get rid of the leaves when they turn brown then they look ugly but yeah and they get really slimy yeah so if you don't get rid of them quick they can really be a pain i made that mistake like last later. year i wasn't i w didn't make that mistake this year i got rid of the leaves earlier um so yeah hostas that sounds like that'd be a pretty good way to divide them so elliot wait until the spring don't do it now and then you and, can. And then you have more one, leaves to eat. That, that's right. <laughs> and the one thing I don't know if there's any hosta you shouldn't eat or anything, but I know they eat them like mad in Japan. But they have special varieties they grow for eating because they're more tender and delicious and things. Yeah. So just just so you know that. Huh. Okay, well, we just had one question that we didn't get to, but we will ask that one the first thing next time. That This one was sent in by Lila. So, Lila, tune in next week, and we will get to your, orf your orphaned hydrangea plant. Um, okay, I am dying to know, what is the story with the fleas? What is good about okay. fleas? All right, there's only one thing I've ever been able to find that's good about fleas. And it's, it gives our old dogs exercise. Scratching. So a brilliant caller got it right. Yes, yes. That was Beverly. Beverly from Port Angeles. Do, 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 do. She wins yep, the prize. Was, <laughs> all right, Beverly, you are the pro. You win the Brussels Sprout of the Week Award for awesome. that one. It's a very prestigious award, let yeah, me tell you. I know. And uh, it's... Fleas are the only thing that used to give my old dog, Fred, any exercise when he got really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cisco, once again, we have had so much fun. And we, oh, I don't know so about fun. you, but I needed this. I with, as I said at the beginning of the show, between the politics and the pandemic, I was so looking forward to hearing your melodious voice on the other end of the phone and talking about gardening, which can make such a big difference in people's lives. You just go out and dig in the it dirt can. and see things grow. So, yeah, um, and it's so beautiful out there right now. Everything's changing color. And, you know, the hummingbirds are still busily eating away out there. And uh, so, uh, Get out in the garden or get out and do a walk and enjoy the beauty of this season. Okay. Well, th is that your sending advice for everyone? Get outside, get some fresh air, just enjoy. You know, we here in the Pacific Northwest, we have the mountains, we have the water. And I was so touched to hear on the ferry report this morning that on Wednesday, Veterans Day, the ferries at 1111, they will sound the horn in honor of Veterans Day. I thought that was very nice. That so Yeah, and uh, hey, congratulations uh, to all you people that have been in the Air Force, especially you, Sassy. Yes, and I'm going to be talking about the Air Force in just a few minutes. My, my best buddy from the Air Force uh, just sent me a text. She's listening from Minnesota. And uh, oh. so uh, she will be able to enjoy the Air Force information that I'm going to share in a few minutes. But we will see you. We will uh, not see you. We will talk to you next week, Cisco. So get those plants in the garage and enjoy your week. And I'll talk to you next Saturday. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Cisco. Bye, everyone.